let's get started. Um, I want to thank everybody uh, for coming today. I want to uh, spe uh, especially thank uh, Dr. Uh, Yun Xiang Yen for coming to visit us from UCLA. Uh, I also want to thank our co-sponsors, the History Department and Professor Pytel, who's here today, and also Pam Crossan, uh, who's always so instrumental in organizing these events. Uh, the History Club representatives, uh, which are here today, and Phi Alpha Theta, the College of Social and Behavioral Sciences, the College of Extended Learning, the College of Business and Public Administration, the University Diversity Committee, the Departments of Anthropology and Sociology, and Fowl Library, and as well the uh, Intellectual Life Fund. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Yun Xiang Yen today, um, a native of Beijing. Yun Xiang Yen was forced to drop out of school at the age of 12 and spent the subsequent 12 years working as a shepherd and farmer in two Chinese villages during the Cultural Revolution period in China. It lasted from 1966 until 1976. He returned to school in 1978, earning a BA in Chinese literature and an MA in folklore and mythology from Peking University, and a PhD in social anthropology from Harvard University. He has previously taught at the Chinese University of Hong Kong and Johns Hopkins University, and is currently Professor of Anthropology and Director of the Center for Chinese Studies at UCLA. Unpacking and understanding the moral experiences of ordinary people in the fast-changing world today constitutes the abiding theme in his anthropological career over the last 20-plus years. And his research interests include family and kinship, economic anthropology, social change and development, cultural globalization, and the individual-society relationship. He's the author of The Flow of Gifts, Reciprocity and Social Networks in the Chinese Village from Stanford University Press, 1996, Private Life Under Socialism, Love, Intimacy, and Family Change in the Chinese Village, 1949 to 1999, also from Stanford University Press in 2003, and The Individualization of Chinese Society, uh, 2009 from Berg. He's also a Guggenheim Fellow in 2010-2011, and is currently working on a book manuscript about individualization and moral changes in post-Mao China. Please join me in welcoming Professor Yen. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Murray for the invitation, and I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank everyone of you professors and students, ladies and gentlemen, for giving me this opportunity to share some of my latest research on this particular topic. Speaking of this topic, if I ask you, what is the significance of studying family life? Depending on our social context uh, here in the United States, you will probably automatically come up with the idea that family is important because it's about my happiness, personal life, so on and so forth. What I like to argue is throughout this talk, and as a background of departure point, is that in China, the family, family institution, family life, family structure, family relations, all the things are more than personal happiness. Actually, it used to be much less relevant to personal happiness. It was a part of the nation state's efforts to pursue modernization in the sense to how to change the family, make the family uh, if an effective unit for the nation state to catch up, to realize the goal of modernization. It was entirely different. It has a lot of uh, meanings in the public domain rather than private domain. What I'm trying to describe is Exactly the shift, what I call it the privatization of the family. How the family has become increasingly a personal matter, closer and closer to what we understood a family should be. And then that caused a lot of problems in Chinese society because it is such a radical shift, a transformation by and of itself. So that's uh, uh, the general background. General background and um, also I understand that uh, many of you guys here are either from the history club or taking class 
in modern European history. So what you are going to hear from me might bear some similarities to European history 300, 300 plus years ago. But um, again, there is a very interesting twist because uh, what happened in China in the last uh, century, and particularly in the last uh, five or six decades, has a lot to do with the state, the nation state efforts to shape, reshape, remote, remote the family. Unlike in the European history, you have this industrial revolution as a general background, and then the family takes the lead, state make a policies on the family afterwards. In China, it is the other way around. State policies help to shape the family. Okay, and uh, here are the major points I wanted to uh, present today, just in case I don't have enough time to go over all of them. Now you can see I have a little um, overview. First, I want to point out that there is this newly emergent international, I'm sorry, intergenerational intimacy, meaning intimacy between junior and the senior generations. Again, you say, what is it so fussy about this, right? There naturally should be some kind of an intimacy across generational line. No, it wasn't. And there was a reason why in the traditional Chinese family, this intergenerational intimacy had to be put under control. And now, pop up. Once it pop up, it leads to some other new developments. And one of those very important new developments was this what I call I call the redefinition of a filial piety. That is the unconditional obedience and the respect from the junior generation to the senior generation, which is one of the core elements of Chinese notion of a filial piety, but it got dropped off. In, uh, which leads to the emergence of uh, emergency of uh, intergen intergenerational intimacy. And then, the, another very important reason of uh, all this new development was, has been the child or the children, in some cases, at the third generation, meaning the grandchild, who plays a very important role as, uh, as a centripetal power that brings two generations, the two above, generations above together, working toward the same goal, which is how to raise the perfect child in the third generation in order to be able to compete in the increasingly market-driven society in China, to be somebody. And when you have all these first the three changed, then the very important part of what I call the existential meaning of the family life. Why do I need a family? Why do I need to live a good family life? That part has changed. It used to be oriented toward ancestors. You work hard for the people who are long, die, uh, long dead. <clears throat> and now you work hard for the grandchild. So that is a very important shift uh, for the uh, focus in family relations and family life as well. That's what I call descending familism. In the past, it was. If there's also familism, it would be ascending familism. All things go back upward toward the ancestors, not toward the child. And um, finally, I would also uh, discuss the implications of all these changes, particularly in relation to public life. That is, there is this potential downside or potential dark aspect of the familism, meaning when people were absorbed so much into familism, they, they tend to ignore or overlook public civic duties. And so there is this natural, uh, there's this uh, inherent um, conflict between the two. But it seems in China, and uh, this has been pretty much favored by the state for political reasons. So that's 
the last point I want to make. Now, departure points. I already briefly mentioned that uh, uh, the family bears a lot of public meanings in the case of China because China wanted to pursue modernity, modernization very quickly, especially if we uh, roll back to, let's say, 150 years ago, and when China uh, dropped from the Middle Kingdom very powerful uh, empire into a second or probably even third tier country which was constantly under the threat of Western powers to be colonized. And um, most elites from all different aspects of society were worried and uh, anxious to change China. They want to take all sorts of reforms so that they could re-enable China back to the important uh, world stage and regain its lost glory. And they try different ways, from political, military, social, all different ways to reform China. All failed. So after the very important political attempt to have a constitution to build the Republic of China, and then they began to think, there must be something wrong deeply, deeply wrong with our society, since we already had the Western weapons, had the Western style of political regime, had the Republic, why we still um, couldn't move up quickly. Then they look inward, look at the individual. The Chinese individual was weak, but not being able to compete. And, uh, and the individual was weak because the Chinese family was oppressive. And it focused on the ancestors, the elderly who are, by definition, conservative. They didn't want change, right? It's understandable ancestors don't want change, and senior people didn't want change either. Therefore, they try all ways to oppress the young. And uh, that <coughs> conservatism in deeply inside Chinese culture with help China from all these possible progresses. So they want to change that. Therefore, around 1910, so precisely about 100 years ago, there was a launch, there's a push for to launch family re uh, revolution to fundamentally change Chinese family institution. And along with the slogan, like, down with Confucius, down with Confucianism. It was a very deeply rooted revolution in the soul, so to speak. And um, inside this family revolution, the core was to challenge parental authority and power. Because all of these uh, oppressive things had to be carried out in real life. Then it was through parental power. Children, younger generation, were required by culture, by the culture, to absolutely obey, not only respect, but obey their seniors. Parents, grandparents, by extension, all senior kings, by extension, all officials, senior in social rank, all the way up to the emperor, to the state leaders. So, it is not conservatism in family culture, it is conservative in political culture at large. So they wanted to overthrow this. Therefore, ever since the 1910s to 1920s, 30s, there is a continual push to challenge parental authority and power. In the first several decades, it was mostly elite-led, intellectual-led movement from top-down approach. It didn't go very far, until 1950s. What happened in the 1950s? In 1949, the Chinese Communist Party took over national power and built the new political regime and also the People's Republic of China. And um, one of the major goals of the Communist Party was to transform Chinese society into a much more egalitarian, and a politically progressive society. We 
which may sound odd to you if you had this uh, stereotypical impression of uh, communism. So they were just uh, authoritarian political state, uh, police state by nature and all the, always that case. In the 1950s, at least at the level of idealism, at the level of institutional attempt, it was meant to build this new egalitarian society. Therefore, parental power and authority was one of the targets. And it, go, it went through the, the effort, the state-led effort, went through a number of very effective campaigns legally, like the new marriage law of 1950, which was very liberal and uh, clearly stated that there is a prohibition, a legal ban of a child marriage, concubinage, there is also legal endorsement of marriage by love, there is also institutional arrangement, for instance, if a couple want to marry, they had to literally go to a local government office in front of a local official and say, I love this person, I want to marry this person. In that case, the government could make sure the parents did not intervene. Traditional practice like a bride wealth, the male side paid the female side for the marriage were legally banned. There's many other things being banned, there's other things being legally pushed, so that's one thing. There's this ideological campaign through literacy movement, teaching people how to read. And then by, by learning how to read, they learn all this new content, revolutionary content, such as there should be gender equality, and the women should have the inheritance rights. All of this being taught through these uh, night schools for adults and the formal schooling to younger generation. So that's another one. There's also political campaigns at the mass rallies. They would have brought in the notorious uh, patriarch, the old fathers, grandfathers who are known to be very authoritative and um, to the meeting, mass meeting like this, much bigger than this, and force uh, the, the patriarch to confess in front of the people, the whole crowd saying, I did this wrong, I hate my wife, I bullied my children, and after that, what would happen? That person's moral authority was gone. In the Chinese culture, if you ever heard the word faith, that person's faith was completely lost, right? So all of these little things added up from the 1950s to the 1960s through the most radical years of 1966 to 76, which is known as the Cultural Revolution period, and all the way around to, around to the peak during the Cultural Revolution, was attacking all these parental authority and power. So by late 80s and early 1990s, we saw clearly in both urban and rural China a constant decline of parental authority and power. And the other side of the same, uh, same point is the rights of youth autonomy and power, such as the right to choose a mate. I don't think that's a a meager matter. It is very important for the nation state. If you got the right to choose your own mate, meaning your parents will not control your marriage, meaning the person you chose would very likely from different be different from the person your parents chose for you. Why? Because if when your parents chose a mate for you, they are looking at the person from their perspective. They want a daughter-in-law or son-in-law who respect the elder. But if you choose a person, you know what? Chemistry makes it, right? You want a person you like, you love, so on and so forth, <coughs> who may or may not obey your parents. So that's what. And therefore, use of power arise along with the decline of friend of power. And that's the, the background. When I started to do my research, in the 1980s. So I did my major part of my research in a particular rural community where I used to live there in the 70s for seven years as an ordinary farmer. 
and left there for college. So I knew those people from very early on. And then I went back in 1989 to do my first long-term field work. I began to chart all these changes in family life, what I call the transformation of a private life. But I aimed at the political social implications beyond the family circle. So what I had eventually in the 2003 book are, were two grand uh, conclusions or observations. One is there was, has been a double transformation. On one hand, the family has been transformed from a corporate group. In the past, in traditional Chinese culture, the family used to be a corporate group. Family was there, meaning to fight all the battles, meaning to run the business, to survive, basically, for most of the people. The larger, the better. Why? Economy of scale. You have a division of labor. But if you are running a big company, what do you need? You need a discipline. You need an order. How can you have discipline and order? Hierarchy. Therefore, that is necessary in traditional family as a corporate group. There is this very much uh, heavily reinforced hierarchy based on gender, female obey to males, and generation, junior obeying to senior, and age. Age matters in Chinese culture as well. And the younger ones obey to the senior, older ones. Putting all three together, you have a very elaborate hierarchical system in traditional family, which reinforces the family as a corporate group. But what I got argue in the first part of the first <laughs> observation is that part is gone. And because of all these uh, state-sponsored attempts to change, transform the family, therefore, the family has been shifted or transformed from a corporate group into a private haven for individuals to live personal life. Meanwhile, the Chinese family lost its major function as an economic business union, simply because during the first three decades of Chinese socialism, from 49 to 78, there was a collective uh, way of, it was a collective planned economy. The state controlled everything. People are, were all working for the state. Therefore, the family ceased to be an economic unit. They become increasingly a consumption and living unit. That's the first part. And, uh, the other part is that when the family becomes a private haven, boom, all the time, all of a sudden, personal happiness becomes important. In the past, happiness, your happiness, my happiness, was not important. Why? Because of all we did, all the causes we worked so hard were all related not to we as individuals, he said, ancestors, how to glorify our ancestors, how to continue the family line as long, as strong as possible. That was the goal of our personal life. So people worked hard, extremely hard. Would they be paid back to get a gratification? Yes, they would. But it was delayed gratification, meaning by the time you became father, when the father, and ancestor, you will get all the rewards. By the way, in the traditional time, and, and before what I'm talking about currently, there was uh, pretty much uh, a heavy influence of religion, and both Taoism and Buddhism, as well as the traditional folk religion in China, which focus on ancestor worship. So most people, if not all of them, truly believe we never die, we only go to the other world, and we become ancestors. Therefore, if you look at the Chinese worship ritual, they offer real food along with incense, meaning those people, long deceased people, could really consume those food. And they demand not only delicious food, they want clothing, they want money as well. That's why the Chinese earn paper money. Why? Why do they need money? They need to bribe officials in the other world. So they basically live a very secular life. 
therefore, people were not afraid of dying, and they just go into the other way. And therefore, they work hard if they know in the future they could live a very glorious life. Once they had so many grandchildren, great-grandchildren, worship them, burning incense, offering foods to them. So there is a meaning of life. And it was delayed gratification. Right? And in that way, if you are not happy in this world, you don't have the many happiness moments, moment, it doesn't matter that much. You are looking to the future. But all of a sudden, one family chain become a private haven for individual life, this issue. Individual happiness, personal happiness, present now and here becomes important, which also comes along with something you are very familiar with, that is a consumer culture, consumerism. So happiness meaning what? For many people, in many case, cases, it meaning I have purchased power. I can buy the things, not things, but the other desirable time, desirable uh, things that I can enjoy. That's part of my habit. So that's the change. The other one, what I documented in 2003 book, was along with this. On one hand, at one level, on one level, there is a clear indication, increasingly the individual, as an abstract term, the Chinese individual, become increasingly uh, in aware of her or his existence which is natural, right? When ancestor is no longer important, you begin to look at yourself. I want to live a happy life. So that's one. Awareness of the self, and along with that, they have an increasingly demand for right, entitlement. I deserve this, I deserve that. Which sounds very close to what we are most familiar with, that is, individualism, right? And, but my argument is that not yet. Because this whole thing came along with a top-down, state-sponsored social reforms aiming at to transform the family for the goal of pursuing modernization. Instead, like what happened in England, in Holland, in other European countries, it was a bottom-up reforms, religious reforms, secular reforms, from bottom-up approach where there's this gradual development of the individualism, which emphasizes not only on your rights, but on your civic duties. So both sides, rights and duties. You earn off all of the rights by doing things. The Chinese way is not like this. Because individualism was uh, very much criticized and attacked by the state, even up to then. And the official discourse still consider individualism as a very corrupt Western ideology needed to be constantly attacked. It's then interpreted as an entirely antisocial, <coughs> selfish philosophy. But which meaning it will downplay or completely overlook the other side, meaning the duties, <coughs> obligation side, and also self-reliance. Western individualism very much emphasized on self -reliance. But uh, here, when the individuals began to arise, and then to pursue individual rights, they do not, like, do not have that part of individualism, which is also very closely related to Western notion of political liberalism, sorry for all these isms. And um, therefore, individuals wanted to have the cake and eat it at the same time. For instance, uh, young villagers in the village I studied, and also everywhere in rural China. They wanted to have a free choice of their mate, a marriage, in a, a independent family life, right after their wedding, which meaning get rid of their parents as early as possible, but they want right wealth. They want <coughs> dowry. According to Western theories of the family change, once you have the first part of the family transformation, right wealth, and dowry will be gone. Because if the peasant, the parents pay for this, the parent will control your marriage. If you don't want the parental control, don't accept the finance from parents. 
Chinese individuals want both, and they have had both, interestingly, remarkable. So that's my argument. And uh, therefore, I call them uncivil individuals. Uh, it's not uncivilized, it's uncivil, meaning they are devoid of a civil virtues. So that's still in the uh, private life sphere. Later on, I will go a little bit over to the public side. Now, uh, just a quick note. Uh, the following still rely on my uh, longitudinal field work in the same village with uh, evidences drawn from other parts of China as well. And uh, I've been back to the village for 13 times, a longer or shorter stage, and then I published some of those new findings and new findings in early articles as well. Now, these are the major new findings uh, in the last uh, five to seven years, such as the increasing importance of personal happiness and the continuation of the power transfer from junior, uh, senior to junior generation, but there's a, this new attempt to reinterpret uh, uh, filial piety. Therefore, they could get rid of the element of obedience and the respect. And then how to live together with your parents, therefore benefits from their financial and other sort of the support, but still remain divided, remain independent. That was a very interesting uh, skill. And later on, I'll explain how they could do this, and so on and so forth. OK. But interestingly, especially this uh, last point, this is what I found the most interesting. That is, uh, later on, when I said all parents, grandparents, working very hard for their grandchild, and that the interpretation is that um, that's the meaning of uh, a person's life, a human being's life you work for the next, uh, for the third generation or for somebody else. Otherwise, your life would be no different from a dog's life, only eating for yourself. So that's their interpretation, which uh, is very uh, interesting to me. It sounds like they make a full circle after all the individualization, modernization, transformation, going back to the same point, but with a totally different focal point. Instead of ancestors, now it's one child. Now, let's skip this part, because this is uh, the so-called scholarship. You know, scholarship meaning for <laughs> <laughs> all the detail, very solid things. And uh, basically what I'm saying, I have two tables, and to show I was not able to insert them in, fortunately, was not able to insert them into the PDD to show the change of the household structure. You know, how big the family is, how many generations live in the family. This is boring detail, but it matters greatly. Meaning, if you are living in a big, what is scholarly called extended family, you have parents, grandparents living together with you, and uh, with the same budget, household budget, what does that mean? It means only one couple would be in charge. Chances are you are not in charge. There you have to obey to your parents. And also, there's a lack of a privacy, right? And so you will be constantly under the watchful eyes of so many people. So it matters, a big versus a small family. A complete, complex structure, meaning multi-generations, many couples living together versus a comfortable family where a couple with children living together. Uh, so therefore, uh, there's this trend continue from conjugal, uh, toward conjugal independent and smaller household size. For instance, the village I study used to have about uh, 1,500 people, 14, uh, 1,469 people in 1980, and the average household size, meaning how many people live in the household, was 5.3 in 1980. And 33 years later, in between, I also had figures. 33 years later, by 2013, the population actually dropped from 1,500 to less than 1,300. It's about 500 people less, two reasons. One is the single child policy. 
population control policy had a real impact, which led to the decline of the rate and also the decline of people's willingness to have more children. Even nowadays, when the Chinese government relaxed the policy, allowing people to have a second job, many couples prefer not because the living cost has gone up, and also the living cost has gone up again for two reasons. One is absolutely up due to inflation. Two is people's living standards have improved, meaning what kind of child life you want your child to have has changed, right? Uh, let, let's back. How many pair of shoes each one of you have? Mm. I'm sure it should be more than 10. <laughs> but for a long time, from age, let's say, 5 as long as I could remember, to age 26, 28, I only had one pair. Unless that pair becomes absolutely broken, then if I were lucky or my family would lucky manage to get a second pair. So they both are standard of reason child are living a life. But now there's a big difference in terms of uh, in terms of monetary investment, right, between one pair versus the child and pair of shoes. If you think of other aspects of life, therefore the cost of raising a child has gone up very right? Therefore people don't want to have more children. If you have less children, you put more investment in the, in your child and the cost gone up. So it's a vicious circle. Second reason of population got dropped was out of migration. A larger and larger number of migrated to cities who work there, so on and so forth. So, 30 years, more than 30 years later, the population in the village dropped by 200 people, and the family the household size also dropped from 5.3 to 3.3 per household. It's basically a couple with a child. So that's what, what I mean by the first point. But, the first point, by logic, would lead to what Chinese uh, Western uh, theories call nuclearization of the family, pretty much like the ideal American middle class family, coupled with their own children, unmarried children. No, it didn't happen in China. Instead, it was this. Although the family is getting smaller, but there's, a, there's a, this stand family continue. People still want to live with their parents because the parents could be a good helper mm -hmm. in many ways. And so this is a dilemma. You want your parents, yet you don't want their interference in your life. You want their contributions. How could you manage that? And um, there's... Oh, So they go by this. They create new forms of a household where this is two in one, meaning when I need you, we live together. When I don't need you, go home. <laughs> Sounds pretty ideal, right? So I will explain why. But the point is, uh, oh, that's what the table shows. OK. Now I'll go back to the next one. Then I'll come back. Also. My argument is that economic rationality was not the only uh, single factor of Chinese people chose to choose what kind of a household structure they want. There are many other factors, because if you look at my data, which shows over uh, the last several decades, I always do the household yen survey, uh, not only population change, but also change in their economic status. It's very clear. Stand families, bigger families, tend to do better economically. They are the pro proportion of uh, big families in the rich family household category. It's much larger. Nuclear families tend to be poor. It's very simple. Because in big families, you could have division of labor. Right? Parents or grandparents taking care of the child, the young child, and then the uh, young couple or the middle-aged couple could go out to the cities to seek work or in local, uh, participate in local uh, economy, so on and so forth. And also, villagers know clearly that although being together would be very easy to get rich, but being together harmlessly 
can get you rich. But being together, yet always fighting would not. So therefore, the second factor they would check was, can we get along? If we can get along, we manage to get along, we are getting together. We stay together in a big family. Otherwise, we stay, rather to bear the economic consequences. So again, the question is, how can you achieve family harmony? Stay in a bigger family, therefore gain all the economic benefits, and at the same time, keep your own independence and freedom. That's the challenge. That's how people did. And there are some interesting way people do this. In the last two decades or so, there emerged these two forms of a household of families. One is what I call the all that stamp. Stamp family is a jargon, meaning there will be two generations of married couples living in the same household. Married couple with or without their children, plus most cases husbands, sometimes wives, parents. So it's two married couples in two generations living in the same household. That's called a stamp family, right? Now, ever since the 1990s, when Chinese state push for urbanization, and therefore along with that, there's this push for urban development, real estate development, build houses, apartment buildings, to allow people to buy. Same trip as we are experiencing here. But in the Chinese case, it's one to the extreme. There's a lot of ghost towns, there's a lot of people who buy more than one, and letting them empty, so on and so forth. So currently, the, the, um, the rate of household uh, real estate for property ownership of Chinese people is close to 70 plus, uh, much higher than the rate here. But in the countryside, in the place I did my research, it was in the county seat, previously county seat, now a day has become a lower tier city. They began to build this. The land was cheap, right? And they built a lot of the buildings, condominium buildings, and called people to buy, luring people to, to buy those. And uh, villagers began to take the option because the younger generation no longer wanted to live a rural life. They wanted to live an urban life. If they cannot afford and legally they are not allowed to live in big cities like Beijing or Shanghai, they will go to smaller cities. And the, the previous county seat is the easiest option for them to find a job and live there. So they wanted to buy. And therefore, some parents began to buy a condominium unit in the county seat for their son. And then quickly it became a standard affair in bread wealth. If you want to get my daughter married to your son, show the proof that you have bought a unit in the city. And when it becomes a standard practice in Red Wells, it's a firm demand. So a large, increasingly larger number of villagers had to buy. And then they buy a unit in the cities, and then their sons and daughter-in-law marry, move in the cities, and quickly they have a job. And in order to support the mortgage, because the parents mostly pay for the uh, first down payment, in order to support the uh, mortgage, and uh, they needed both to work. Nobody staying home to take care of the baby or the toddler. And then they call on their, uh, grand uh, their parents. So grandparents are coming to cities to take care of their um, grandchild, forming what I call quasi step. Um, why quasi? because financially they remain separate. And the grandparents have their own household back in the village. And um, young couples have the independent household in the city. But when the grandparents in the city taking care of the grandchild, they actually do a lot of grocery and pay other fees and out of their own pocket. So they, there's a net contribution from the grandparents. And the parents basically get the support. And therefore, periodically, especially during business, agricultural, uh, agricultural busy seasons, the grandparents would return home to continue farm their land. By the way, 
uh, land has not been privatized in China yet. State-owned land actually allocated to all farmers, peasants. Each person has a, a small plot of land, so they need to take care of land, land unless they run them out for other people to farm. So this quasi-family, the two units, for most of the time of the year, living together, but remain financially independent. In this case, the younger couple benefits with them. The grandparents make uh, contributions. And the next one, this, skip generation families, are those who stay in the village, yet the young couple in the middle generation, they have gone out to the cities to work, seasonal work, running, by, by my definition, it has to be longer than six months, and then only come back to home for a short period of time. So that's why they were called skip generation families. Because inside of the home village, you actually have the grandparents generation and the grandchild generation living together. The middle generation is gone. And then only during certain time of the year, they come back to re reunite with their own child in the third generation. So in both forms, the quasi stem family and the state generation families, the household structure become very flexible, change, constantly changing according to people's needs. Therefore, in the 70s, this scholar, Myron Cohen, already noticed the Chinese family actually is very flexible. It contains three parts. The estate, meaning property part. The group, meaning the people, together. And the economy, meaning the things they do. They could be concentrated, meaning all together. They could be dispersed, such as people dispersed to different places, doing the household economy separately, but they share the same estate. They remain in the same group. But what is new? in the last several decades for me to observe is these two forms. Because all of these is still you consider as one family. Just the three components could be dispersed. But here is after family division, meaning they already gain their financial and family life independence. But it is the temporary reunite and to work. And then in some other time of the year they go back to be independent. In this case you're really able to maintain your independence. Because any time we can no longer get along, we can go back to our original separate condition. So we stay together by necessity first, economic, other necessities to reach the third generation, to reach the grandchild. But that one only goes to a certain point. If we no longer can bear with each other, we just go back and bear and take some economic down, uh, downward consequences that can still regain our independence. That's the flexibility of this new household term. All right, in order to reach to that level, it requires a redefinition of a field of piety. Because if according to the old logic, right, and junior generation should respect and obey the senior generation, if that remains true, it would not be possible to call in your parents to help you to raise your child anytime and they are needed. When they are not needed, just simply telling them, you can go home now, it won't be possible. <clears throat> if we look at the Philippine, again, in traditional Chinese culture, it contains three components. One is the perpetuation of descent lines through human reproduction and ritual <coughs> services. That is, you need to produce children to fulfill your ability, uh, philippine obligation, as many as possible, as many sons as, uh, as possible, because the daughters don't come. Daughters are married out of your group, and they are somebody else, wives, mothers. So you have to have as many sons as possible. Therefore, you fulfill your duty and continue this family line. If you become a childless, what would happen? The family line got cut off. It's gone. So they are your duty, extremely guilty of failing to continue the family line. You will be shameless, has no um, 
or your space to look back to your ancestors. And, uh, and then, also, you need to constantly make offerings to your ancestors as a part of the filial piety. And the second component is uh, respect and submission to the senior generation. The third one is care and support, which is uh, more uh, material. You need to both have emotional caring and a financial uh, materialistic support uh, for the older generation. But now, what I have been challenging is uh, the second and the first. The, the first two part actually, because by having less and less children, even in the village, some couples were content of having a single daughter, simply because, of the, as I mentioned, the high cost of raising a child, and the high cost, even higher cost, of getting your son married. It is the Chinese parents' absolute obligation to get their son married, finance their son's marriage, up to the current standard. That standard has constantly been uh, raised higher and higher. Therefore, it's very expensive to have sons in China. And um, therefore, increasingly, more parents decide, actually, it's not bad to have a daughter. Because a daughter, you don't have to pay that much. And daughters, after marriage, actually treat you better than sons <laughs> treating you. Why? Because increasingly, there's this gender power shift as well. Sons, after getting married, they are more sensitive toward their conjugal relationship, they listen to their wives. And then their wives say, be nice to my parents, and they will be nice to their parents-in-law. You only have one person inside you, you have your ability is limited, right? When the loyalty being shifted toward your parents-in-law, naturally you are ignoring your own parents. So, increasingly, daughters become really nice, filial daughters, and taking their husband with them, Therefore, sons become increasingly unfilial sons. Therefore, increasingly, people figure out it's not bad to have a daughter. Right? And uh, so that first line is gone, public. There's still a single child to continue the family line, but not multiple lines to continue the single child. And the second one, unconditional respect and submission. When this happens, they want to get rid of this delayed gratification instead of want to emphasize their own happiness. And um, ever since the 1990s, when I started to ask people, particularly young people, you didn't work hard enough? Did you, did you every month did you give money to your parents? No. Even the, when they were working in the cities, they had the salaries, right? I asked them how much did you send back? No, actually zero. Why? Because we need to buy this, we need to go to karaoke bars, we need to go to the restaurant, and to date, so on and so forth. Actually, what I earned was not enough. I, my parents sometimes had to send money to me. So it's a reversal of the care and the support. I, said, I would say, is this philippiety or the other way around? He said, it is philippiety. Got shot. I couldn't understand. He said, "You know what is uh, filial piety? Is to make my parents happy. But what makes my parents happy? I'm happy. Therefore, they're happy. <laughs> right? Their purpose is to make sure I'm happy. So therefore, they send my money, send me money. I live a happy life. They're happy. Everybody is happy. Wow. <laughs> it turned out I was." Totally outdated, <laughs> right? And it, I just couldn't believe this. I go back to their parents and to ask them. And um, the older gener generation would say, it's true. Although they, would, they hope it was not true, but society has changed. They feel the peer pressure to make their children happy. But in the era of consumerism, how do you judge in front of the eyes of your peers, meaning the other old generation, old parent, your son is happy? Buy things, build a house, buy a condo, all these material things to, to pour onto your son. Therefore, you earn prestige, you earn social face among your peers. Everybody is in the same mode, so they compete and to make their sons happy. 
when this happened in the uh, in the context of a single child policy ever since the mid 1980s it's not only material life in terms of material life to be happy but to make your son somebody to compete to go to college and to have a higher degree to get the best paid job to be somebody so in that village I did my field work I was the first one ever since 1949 to leave the village to go to Beijing University, the very top university in China, and remain the single one up to date. So the local legend is the parents would give all the nice material things to their child when they were young, in middle school, high school, or even primary school. Meanwhile, telling them, we are doing all of this for you so that someday you will become a little Yan. Because my nickname is Little Yan. I was a little, I was young, and physically little as well. So I remain to be a local legend today, but increasingly I become somebody to be hated by the young people. <laughs> right? <laughs> Nobody could have become me, and then their parents constantly on their back to say, become a little young, become a little young, and we buy this for you. So there is another thing. And uh, therefore, it's not only a shift to instant gratification, but increase, increasingly the younger generation constantly being showered by this, therefore they gradually have this entitlement. I deserve to live a happy life. I don't think that you would, many of you would dispute with that. But in my generation, I can confess to you, I'll attest to you, I never had that thought. We were taught, we came to this world to suffer. Truly. So this is even sacred, holy. You know, it has a religious element there. We came to this world to suffer, to make a contribution. So there's a fundamental shift in terms of how you see your own life. And for the younger generation, it is a person of happiness. And therefore, when this is happening, naturally, emotions become increasingly important. In the past, in my generation, when life was tough, emotions were there. Love stories in China, don't, don't get me wrong. People do get madly in love, so on and so forth. But it was not ideologically legitimized. In America, people get married for money sometimes. But ideologically, in America, love is enshrined. You will get married for the only sake of falling in love. No question about it. Reality might be different. In China, in traditional China, it was the other way around. Sometimes people get married in love, but in most cases, and also in the ideological, in the, in the, in the ideological construction, you get married to produce children. Produce children to continue the family line, to glorify your ancestors, and become ancestor yourself. Just thinking about the Christian belief of how you live your life, what is the purpose to live your life? To glorify God. It's a similar thing. So now, when it becomes personal happiness becoming important, right? And then increasingly this part, emotional, there's this emotional turn. First, starting with the young generation, they emphasize emotional attachment to their mate. Therefore, this is a pursuit for love, romantic love. And um, by the way, this is again something peculiar about China. What defines a romantic love? I think in the America, in American culture, romantic love is you fall in love solely for the sake of love without other concern. But in China, for quite a long time, romantic love means you're fighting against your parents' will. You have to fight. If everything goes smoothly, it's not romantic love. It's just a free choice. So that tells you the background is different. Because in the past, always parental control. Right? So the, the first the intimate emotional turn is horizontally. Happened in the sphere of a made choice. But increasingly, it's spilled over to other domains of family life. And um, but before we reach to that level, if you connect all the dots I mentioned so far, and I would say 
there's, there's a shift from, uh, his, sorry, this is a Chinese word, meaning the old ancestors, lots of them, to little, in quotation mark, ancestors, meaning the, the grandchild. The grandchild becomes the quasi grandparent, right? So they become the so called the fetal type. Also, there is a black horse perspective. Increasingly, when I say nowadays, parents and grandparents are getting along increasingly. So far, I only emphasize the economic necessity factor. But there's also that course factor as well. Increasingly, the younger couples who were born in the 80s, in the 90s, early 90s, they become parents themselves. And they began to bear all the responsibilities, burdens of life. Therefore, they become more understanding of the sacrifices that their own parents had made for them before. So with that understanding, they naturally treat their own parents better, but also in exchange that their parents would help them more. So it's all related, and therefore, um, the, when they have this new understanding of their parents' past sacrifice, they begin to share more with their own parents. There's this emotional and intimate term, vertically as well. They share more, and sometimes they offer gifts, and then they treat their parents much more better, so on and so forth. So I'm going faster. Again, with all of this, at the same time, they cannot give up. To give up their own demand of a better material life, therefore they also need their own parents' support. So both sides, economic necessity, meaning their parents' support, and emotional turn, meaning being closer to their parents truly from their heart. Both sides play a role here. But in addition to that, they do have a goal here, that is, uh, they become a parent, and they even be going more radically, they're their own parents, to hope to have the perfect child, which is another thing peculiar about China. In the entire country with 1.4 billion people, everybody believed in the same goal, wanted to live the same kind of life, meaning the glorious life you often see from TV screen. And I always tell my Chinese audience, saying, it's not the case in the States. In America, life has been stratified. The ideal of life, what kind of ideal life I want to have, that part is also stratified. Some of you, I can guarantee, some of you probably don't even want to move into Beverly Hills. Right? They have their own stress, they have own problems. Right? We would rather to have a happy family in a community of uh, working class people, beautiful garden, pick up trucks, and so forth. It's a different life, right? Some people in rural China would think people in Los Angeles are nuts. <laughs> but in China, everybody thinks Shanghai is the place to go. Beijing is the place to go. So in terms of family ideal, life ideal, is a singularized, concentrated flight time as well. That's what happened, which is another thing. But in terms of how to raise a perfect child, I'm not joking. The entire village wanted their grandchild. Again, they haven't given up yet to become little yet. And by large, uh, by, by extension, everybody in the country wanted their grandchild to go to Beijing University to go to Harvard. So then, what happened? The competition becomes even more severe, right? Because basically, you are crowded in a narrow pathway of life. They become crowded, and the only way you can do is to push somebody down or outside the past. So to make it even more severe, that's what happened in China. That also partially explains the Chinese economic miracle, right? Because the Chinese had to work double hard, 100% more hard, harder, and in order to push everybody down, everybody outside of the past, myself going through. But don't get it wrong. In my own case, I wonder purely by luck. It's right after the Cultural Revolution. Everything was in chaos, so I was able to catch the opportunity. Uh, okay. 
So I think I spent too much time to lay out the background, but anyway, here are easy to understand. I want to talk about intergenerational intimacy, and there are two, I do have a concrete empirical data on that, that is uh, in these several aspects that I check how, how frequent they will have this communication. You talk to your parents, older parents, or grandparents, and what do they talk? And so on and so forth, so I double check on that. But the most important thing is that right now, this is a Chinese word, go tone, meaning the English word communication, is a two-way exchange. In the past, in the old-fashioned of Philip Hyde, it's one way. A senior generation lecture, and junior generation listen. And now it's a two-way exchange, and in this two-way exchange, junior generation kind of have more to say, because their life experience is more interesting to one of the city, so on and so forth. Along with that, you have you know, emotional intimacy. That is, how, not, how frequent people use emotional words. Like, I like you, I care about you, I miss you. So I documented all these things in order to show the shift. And the another thing is the personal gift, which is also peculiar in Chinese context, because in traditional Chinese culture, people do not, did not exchange gifts inside the family circle. You offer gifts only to not strangers, people you know, but not so closely related. Why? Because the gift was a lubrication of the interpersonal relations. You don't need to lubricate the relationship with your father. He's already there. He'll be there forever. But now it has changed. Father's Day, Mother's Day, all kinds of holidays become occasions. Their villagers buy a small gifts to offer to their parents. And sometimes the other way around. And interestingly, you have a family tourist so never heard of it before. And the young villagers uh, take the entire family, go to Beijing, Shanghai, and have fun. During this process, we have laughter, uh, together, and chatted, so on and so forth. This is what I call intimacy, emotion. Anything departing from pure world and to emotional domain. And but what I want to emphasize is this. Remember, I only briefly mention along this long process of the transformation of private life, there is this shift of gender power balance as well. Increasingly, women gain more independence and power, and particularly when marriage was on, based on free choice. Therefore, married daughters used to be called spit out water, meaning once the water is being spit out, you cannot take it back. You marry it out, you become somebody else, wife or daughter, you know. Has nothing to do with you. But nowadays, married out daughters actually maintain close relationship with their own parents, which is natural because they were raised by their parents, not by their parents, you know. In the past, it was the Philippine culture required them to treat their parents, you know, much better. But nowadays, they do this for their own parents. For instance, I observe how frequent married daughters buy prepaid phone card for their own parents to use cell phone. And chances are their own parents are old generation, they don't know how to handle cell phone, and so on and so forth. So the married daughters would take care of all of this for their own parents. But sons tend to do much less for their own parents. So those things started with married daughters and then spread over to other domains, especially the married daughters began to once they treated their own parents so well, so nice, after a certain period of time, they feel embarrassed, all the public opinion can kick in, saying you should treat your parents a little better as well. So things began to change incrementally. Therefore, intergenerational relationship improved in this domain as well. And uh, lastly, when intimacy increased, this is different from Western Congo. Intimacy increased, privacy decreased. Because the Chinese culture does not really draw clear boundaries between individuals to begin with. Therefore, in Western culture right now, we, this similar things happen in Western family as well. In the literature, there's this heavy emphasis on the intimate term. But when we say intimacy, we want also meaning, uh, also means, meaning I'm intimate with you I can disclose myself to you. That's the definition of the intimacy. But 
this closing intimacy doesn't mean yourself and myself will merge together. You remain you, I remain me, independent. But the Chinese culture does the other way around. To measure the intimate and the per degree of perfection of a friendship is to measure how much the two persons merge together, becomes one. Right? And yours is mine, mine is you, I would do whatever for you, you would do whatever for me, so on and so forth. And your business is also my business. And um, that partially explains for those who, especially Professor Murray, the one who have gone to China to observe the drinking culture in China, where if you, people, you will be convinced persuaded, even forced to drink hard liquor until you completely fell up. Then they, they say, you are a good friend. Why? <laughs> because you literally, physically surrender self. Wow. Right? In the States, in American cultures, that way. Therefore, when intimacy increases, privacy decreases, and therefore, constantly people interfere in each other's business. And, but in this context, since the junior generation gaining more power than the senior generation, most likely it's the junior generation in the fear, senior generations, isn't it? For instance, it's coming very difficult for parents, old parents, to get remarried, and widowers, a widow, because their, parents, their children would not allow them to do so, so on and so forth. So that's one thing. And uh, also, the Chinese cultural emphasizing on inter, uh, intentionality. When intimacy increases, you, you and me are truly good friends or brothers. I should be able to think what you want from me than act out before you ask me. How complicated this is? This is a, a major reason I decided to stay and teach in the US. Because I don't have that ability to figure out everybody what they want from me, therefore beforehand then I act out, before they ask me. I become, get used to the American way. If you want me happy, you say it. <laughs> In Chinese culture, you don't say it. You never say it. And then I have to think about it for you and do it for you before you ask. So that intention of it is very important. Then become making the whole family life even more complicated. So therefore, what I'm saying basically is intimacy doesn't mean harmony. This is two different issues. People getting closer and closer together actually could increase the frequency of a family quarrels because there's more chance to interfere in each other's life. It's totally paralyzing issues. All right, so we've got to stop somewhere, right? This is a slide to show you the social background and uh, quickly go through this and then I'll be more than happy to answer questions if you are curious about it. One is uh, family still in the States when there is this individualization process, you have other mechanisms to, to be related to people, such as you can go to church, you can have found your own interest group, so on and so forth. But in China, uh, mostly uh, it's this very powerful state and uh, which prevent from happening for any other kind of social civil groups and therefore, they don't have many intermediate groups for people to relate to or be joined uh, as a member. Therefore, a family life alone has something to, for people to re emerge, uh, re embedded into as a group. Therefore, this intergenerational relationship becomes increasingly important. Second thing is, ever since the market already the reforms, and probably the trust has been going down, and the personal trust becomes increasingly important. Who can you trust most? Of course, your parents. Vice versa, your parents will trust you most, not strangers, not friends. And um, there's this auto migration have an impact already when I talk about the skip generation household structure. And finally, this is something related to this to us as well. My observation is that ever since the 1980, late 80s, particularly since the 1990s, throughout the entire globe, generation of gang has shrunk in the sense that ideologically we don't have much difference. Before, if uh, in this room there are only a few individuals who hopefully uh, 
gone through the 1960s. And I was born in 1954, so very old, like a dinosaur. <laughs> right? In 1960s, the two generations absolutely had different opinions about almost everything in the world. So therefore, you had uh, revolutions. You have all kinds of social protests for big political issues. Because they have different ideas what our society should be. Political regimes, democracy versus communism, so on and so forth. But ever since the fall of the uh, former Soviet Union, Eastern European bloc, and then China, along other countries, began to market our under reforms, China actually, in some aspects, more capitalist than the United States. So capitalism becomes the only regime in our contemporary world. Everywhere else, no other alternatives. Therefore, we basically share the same. So if you observe current your generation, the student, you and your parents and your grandparents don't have much different. We do have difference. That is, to choose what color of shoes we should buy. But we don't have much difference in terms of what kind of a political regime we should have. Right now, it's mostly lifestyle. Lifestyle has big issues, right? Such as, uh, as uh, sexual orientation. It becomes a very important issue, but it's still a lifestyle, personal, individual lifestyle. Therefore, this happening in China as well. Intergenerational consensual solidarity. And therefore, they can talk to each other. They watch the same TV program and that they concern the same things in consumer culture, and so on and so forth. That about this. Okay. Finally, I could just say it in one or two minutes, that is, uh, the family becomes increasingly important for Chinese individuals. Intergenerational relationship has improved. Parents really help a lot of their children, their adult children rely more on their parents. Together, the two generations work very hard to raise the perfect child in the third generation, and that consequently, the three generations form a trinity across generational lines, working together very hard to build a family life. And they are very much into this, and uh, so much so, I call them a descending family. And the state also had a number of new policies to help push this way. Therefore, Chinese individuals are increasingly toward, uh, move toward uh, the concerning only how to build a good family life, harmonious family life, present or happening. Nothing wrong about this. But remember, you don't remember, it's not remember, recall what I said in the very beginning. In 1910, the Chinese elite uh, push the reforms, family revolution, exactly the case. It's uh, all individuals only concerned about their family. Nobody was concerned with the nation state. Nowadays, it's different, slightly different. Nobody was concerned, concerned as a few people were concerned about what happened in the society, in public life, so on and so forth. Therefore, we just, uh, the Chinese individuals, we just left all these issues to the hands of a very powerful state. To take care of. A state could be a very uh, benign, paternalistic state, but it's still authoritarian. Paternalistic, authoritarian. So, is that an ideal situation? So, that is uh, my uh, last concern about it. All right, thank you very much, and I'm, I'm apologies for dragging this so long. <laughs> We have time for some questions. I hope you guys uh, have some questions. So the uh, family revolution of 1910, um, the tail end of the Qing Dynasty, would you consider that to sort of be a, sort of a watershed defining moment in uh, the creation of what uh, the course China will take over the 20th century? Yes and no. Yes, in terms of, uh, um, as a push, continued push for political reforms, which eventually end up with the Communist Party taking national power. No, in the sense that it has never become a 
a family revolution. It remained at the level of a political reform, and then, because it never reached to the level of ordinary people's everyday life. Yes, that's a very good question. But without that, I don't think you would have the current yeah. situation. Thank you. Do you think it was necessary in 1949 for um, China to become communist in order for it to revolutionize pretty much? I see. Yeah, that's a very interesting question, although I don't think there is a correct answer to that, because what happened is what happened. Right? We just imagine. Remember in the 1950s, I keep saying remember, I see if you lived through the <laughs> I remember it like yesterday. <laughs> remember the McCarthy period, right? Yes. They were basically saying, did we lose China? Yeah. Somebody because we made some political mistakes. Could be, mm -hmm. right? And uh, because a bunch of American advisors who saw the real hope from Communist Party instead of his political opponent. But at that time, the Chinese Communist Party was a much better fellow, mm -hmm. truly. So it's hard to say. But overall, I would say, no matter which party took national power, the direction of the change will remain the same. If you want modernization, because the core of my argument here is what is the central, central thing of a modernity and modernization? It's us. Every one of us, as individuals, become increasingly important. Our desires, our wants, has to be, must be met. If a nation state, a government could do this, it's a good nation state, a government. So that direction is universal. And so there's a bombs, ups and downs here or there. I'll take some other roundabout ways, but eventually it comes to this way. Yes, and then I'm back to Professor Moore. As figure kinship becomes ever more common, uh, how oh, yeah. that will affect the family. Interesting. Particularly important if you take into consideration of the single child policy in China. You get two generations of youngsters who do not have sisters and brothers, right? If they want to have a kin network, what do you do? They give a kinship or cousin. Even cousins, you have only one cousin from another family, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. Yes, but increasingly, um, you take different forms, such as uh, really small brotherhood. I had, used to have a PhD student who did research in the central part of China on Swan Brotherhood, which happened to be the region where I came out with the novel, a few Brothers. All and men are brothers. Okay, right. Watermark. It's kind of a Chinese type of uh, Robin Hood story. So they, they have this local culture. In other parts, would it be really dear, close, friend, right? natural? Yes, I would say. They do, people have to make up the loss of a real king in order to. Unless Chinese society has become increasingly westernized, marketized, therefore you don't need to rely on kinship type, which is not the case. Yeah, Professor Murray. Uh, I was wondering if you did any comparative work outside of the PRC in a rich Chinese cultural context like Hong Kong or, or Taiwan or the overseas Chinese communities, um, and what you found. Was there any consistency among these communities, or is each context very different? Right. Unfortunately, I didn't. But I tried my best to, to read relevant literature, and um, particularly the so-called Greater China, Chinese societies outside of mainland China, Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong. And, um, and the most important difference, again, is the role of the state. I did not have time to go further on the micro-level causes. If we go there, and the state play a centrally important role. And in other Chinese societies, it's also in the market. And also, simply because there are Chinese societies outside the mainland of China, they tend to be more traditional keeping more traditional culture elements than the counterpart in mainland. And um, because they were against totally different context. It's at the larger context, more westernized context. 
even if in Taiwan is still the case. So that's a very interesting observation, but unfortunately I didn't. The only piece of uh, work I did comparatively is the notion of the civility. I did a work on civility in Taiwan versus in mainland. That's the only thing. Sorry about that. Yes. Um, with the ship focusing from the ancestors to the next generation, to the grandchildren, for couples that had um, infertility problems, was adoption more of an option at that point? Adoption is. Uh, an option, and uh, increasingly it becomes so. And um, but in traditional Chinese culture, adoption is not a um, very good way to go. But if you had to go, you adopt somebody from your brothers. It has to be brothers because you remain the same paternal line, right? Yeah. So that's the first option. But um, increasingly right now, for those infertile couples, the Unless they run running all, all the medical options, they do adoption. Yes. Yeah. This might be a dumb question, but do they have universal health care in, in China? Right. That's a very good question. Because all of this has to do with medical care as yeah. well. Because gotcha. what do you worry about? Is it when you become 93 years old, and then who is going to pay your hospital bill? Mm -hmm. And um, China went up and down several times. So before 1949, no such a thing. Before 1949, we didn't have such a thing either. So it's a rather recent thing all over the world. And afterwards, the Communist Party member was able to build a universal, very comprehensive social welfare system, not only health care, but other benefits, pensions, child care, everything else, including housing, in the cities for urban people. But at that time, 90% of the population living in the countryside. So the government was able to do such a, a comprehensive welfare system, almost like the European one, Western, Northern European, for uh, urban people. In the countryside, it constantly changed, but mainly re relying on the individual contributions plus government subsidies. And then in the 80s, it dropped entirely, going for market, and then caused a lot of problems since the last uh, decade, it came back, the government, and also the government, the Chinese state, become much richer. So they rebuilt the collaborative, uh, cooperative medical care system in the countryside as well. Currently, I uh, think if you get real serious uh, units, and the medical care system would be reimbursed up to 70% in the countryside. In the city, it's always better. It's a very good question. What about going to college? Is that subsidized by the Going to college. I went to the college of free, totally free. And in, not, it's better than free. The government pay me every month. <laughs> Why? Because they used to work in the countryside. It's considered to be already made a contribution to the state. So they pay me a full salary. And um, 20 RMB. No student loans. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, and then after market reform, in the 1990s, the first Chinese reform is starting with pure economy, right? Manufacturers, uh, trade, all those things. In the 1990s, when reforms getting better and better results, and the Chinese state decided to take care of, I mean, launch reforms in other social domain as well. So there's three major ones education, and uh, medical care, and housing. They privatized the housing market before everybody was living in government-owned, government-subsidized housing in the cities. In the countryside, it was much cheaper as a private-owned. But after that, it become somebody just, just gone crazy. Right now in Beijing, Shanghai, those first-year cities, the housing price is as much expensive as in the LA. Several million Chinese RMB to get a flat. And the education as well. Since the 1990s, they began to charge tuitions. But from a very insignificant amount, currently I think it's about, I, w I wanted to say, about 600 US dollars yeah. per year. 
not that much by our standards, but by Chinese income standards, still significant. Demand, considering, used to be zero. Yes? Uh, is the government, is the Chinese government supporting these changes in the family, or are they not you, you, Yeah, actually, you got the core message I wanted to deliver, but I didn't have time to really elaborate. In the 50s, 60s, 70s, when the attack on parental authority and power was well on the way, it was mainly government sponsor. Because at that time, if you think of the youth generation, they, they grew up under the shadow of ancestors, right? You don't have much ideological input, you don't have power, you don't have economic resources to fight against the parental authority to begin with. So this was mainly the government. But you would think, you would want to ask, why the government wanted to do that? Because if a feminism was a very much the dominant, nobody cares about the state, nobody cares about society, then the government wanted to build modernization, build a better industrialized society. They need the contribution, the enthusiastic participation of every individual. And more than that, the Communist Party would be good to solve one issue. That is to build the sense, the sense of the citizenship in China before China was an empire. What does the empire mean to us? We probably don't have direct experience. Abstractly, empire means it is a possession of the emperor. We don't have a part of it. We are just the subject of the emperor. He, or as an emperor or as a king, conquered us. If we did not obey, it would happen, right? So we don't have any concern about the fate of his kingdom or his empire. If we lost, we changed another emperor, everything remained the same. That was exactly the reason, at least argued by the Communist Party member, why China was invaded by Western powers and the emperor was driven out of the capital city by 2,000 soldiers from Britain, other Western country, with more than a million soldiers in the empire. Because nobody cared. It was the emperor's empire. Right? And also, when Japan invaded China during the Second World War, that's a much bigger country. China had no power to resist in the beginning. It's a people that really didn't care. There's a newly released historical material to show how many Chinese individuals willingly collaborated with the Chinese. It was not their country. So what did the Communist Party do in this case? To tell, this is your country. You are the master of the new country. You have the shape. You want to insert this into people's mind, you have to destroy familyism. If everybody loyal, only loyal to the family, nobody cares about the state. So that's why. But nowadays, the Communist Party is pretty secure on, in the throne, right? So therefore, when this trend emerged, increasingly people pay more attention to family life or family values. The state said, yeah, it's a good thing, it's a good thing, very good. So we the issue of the new policy is to encourage this. Because when you, when you go that way, you probably have less interest in issues like, should China become a democratic that is a big question. I have a politically incorrect question. <laughs> I will give you a politically incorrect answer. <laughs> <laughs> we are all doomed. <laughs> it, it, this, uh, the whole argument, fascinating argument, and it reminds me a little bit of the secular, secularization thesis in European history, that rise of individualism. So once you have I guess they shall think, oh, everybody has the right to get rich. You have materialism, consumerism, individualism. And the, the hook is that instead of uh, the secularization, it, it turns to its delirium piety still there, but now it turns inward. Right? Yeah. And that's, that's the overarching argument of it all. So and I find that very fascinating. Now, do you see that happening? Um, and you suggested it there on a kind of global level uh, in terms of Asia. You see, because Confucianism and was a kind of pan-Asian phenomenon. Um, 
And, and along the lines, and here's the politically incorrect side, is uh, in that last uh, debate, uh, Trump's like, hey, we got to close our borders because you know people are having birth babies here, right? And somebody else responded, well, that's mostly Asians that are doing that, right? And, and um, is, I don't know to a degree that it may, may or may not be true. It's certainly true in, in my next door neighbor's house. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's an extended family of about 15 to 18 people, depending which month of the year. Oh there's grandparents and three or four families, and then new babies seem to appear every now and then. <laughs> so I was wondering if you, if you connected, is that a true phenomenon in terms of a, a more global kind of expectation that within that familial piety model that we need to take care of these kids and offer them the best opportunity that can happen. And that's connected to this phenomenon of people taking a lot of money and trying to have their babies uh, born and then partially educated and raised here. Uh, does that make sense? Have you thought about that? Or is that, am I just completely politically incorrect and you can come to go away? <laughs> <laughs> I never thought of that before, but at the moment you started this library, I, I could see the connection. So that's actually a very insightful observation, to say the least. And um, I would argue that it's probably not a global, but a regional phenomenon, meaning a Pan-Asia thing. Yeah. And, uh, but it varies from country to country in terms of the direct uh, motivation, for instance. Just a few days ago, a Taiwanese woman was, was actually back after landing in the U.S. because she gave birth to a baby right on the airplane. <laughs> after, at that particular moment, the first few words she asked was, have we landed on American soil yet? <laughs> With a clear purpose, right? Yeah. So they just decided that. So, but in the case of Taiwan, I don't think it was the direct other uh, uh, kind of concern about political insecurity. But in China, increasingly, the well-to-do people, and they are still worried something radical might happen in China. So they wanted to do this just as extra security. But those individuals themselves, they already made it. They probably don't want it to in the US, to live in the US. But it would be nice as an extra security to have a US green card for their baby to have a passport in the future, who knows, right? And because uh, most of the Chinese parents nowadays still, ideally, they wanted to send their child to study in the U.S. Everybody wants to be young. Yeah, and <laughs> exactly, but only halfway. They wanted their child to go back to China and be successful and then be with the parents. Right. Chances are they spend all the money here the child didn't go through the whole thing, didn't get a good education, and either ended up stick here, stuck here, or going back to China users. So, but that's the reality. Ideally, they still should be for the best. That's one reason. But some middle class families do um, with more sincere uh, intention to do everything possible, making all the sacrifice to make sure their child, single child, to come to the state, so which is not the, the birth issue anymore, it's the student issue, it's a way of students coming. Yeah, all right. So I think that's very interesting you know, angle to connect. One more, one more question. Yeah. Um, do you know if this trend applies to Chinese individuals very important? I'm sorry, can you say that again? Do you know if this trend uh, applies to any individual who marries more? Oh, I see. Well, at one level, the very fact that a Chinese individual marries a foreigner is already kind of very indicative of being more individualistic, right? Otherwise, uh, she or he would uh, choose a traditional, conventional way of marriage. But afterwards, it depends. So some would show continual indulgence or emergence into individualism. Others would turn back because individualism is not the cup of tea for everybody. 
it could taste a very bitter. Because you have to bear so many without protection. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you.